Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to another episode of People Talk with Paul Lawrence. This week, we are focusing on African history. And um, I, I'm very, very, very excited about the people I have lined up to discuss this topic with me today. But before I go into that, I think it's, it's correct for me to first of all say, Happy Father's Day. Um, one day a year, we, 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 can, we can go for it. Yep. Um, doesn't matter whether it's a commercialized day or whatever. Um, it's, it's okay for us just to salute fathers on, on this day. You know, one of the reasons why I'm extremely excited about this, this call today is that I have had the privilege of meeting all three of the people who are my guests on it today um, over the years. Um, some I've known a lot longer than others. But um, I'm going to embarrass one of them by pointing out, as I always do whenever I have the opportunity, to let people know that one of the gentlemen on this call is the first person who sort of decolonized my mind about Black history. I, I met him what must be about 20 years now. And, um, you know, in those days, we were all part of an organization and he used to do black history films um, or films of black interest. It wasn't just historical ones. It was anything to do with films of black interest. And, um, you know, growing up in Jamaica, you know, the, the, the book, The Miseducation of the Negro was so applicable for my upbringing in Jamaica. We were completely and totally miseducated. Um, my understanding of guys like Cromwell Sir Walter Raleigh, all of that. And, you know, the, the, the belief that black history somehow began with slavery. This gentleman um, took those cobwebs out of my head. O over the years, I was able to meet with the second gentleman who is on this call. And I say meet, what I mean by meet is sit in a lecture theater and hear him lecture and um, he, he, his focus at that lecture was more specifically around more ancient African history. And it was the same thing. It was just an absolute mind blowing experience because our history teachers with all good goodwill, they stuck to a, a British curriculum. And I, and I guess empowering us little children wasn't, wasn't on their list of things to do. So having met the second gentleman, heard him speak, it was, again, a fascinating thing and an enlightening thing. My third guest is a she. And, and you know, when I first met her, I first met her at an event where they were, um, she had her books there. And one of her books, because, you know, most of the people on this call, probably except me, you know, done quite a lot in terms of writing and cataloging their work. And the book was about the story of Windrush, but what was more important about it, and, and I think very important about her focus, is that her focus, I believe, and she'll surely correct me if I'm wrong, is about making African history accessible to our younger people and delivering it in a language which people like myself and younger people can understand. Because sometimes when you have such big, massive topics, it's, it's very, very often the case that it's, it's very wordy, it's very complex, and it, it is a wordy and complex topic. But what this guest have done, she has really managed to, you know, do a, a series of books, four or five, I think, um, focused on trying to bring ancient Kush, um, Windrush, you know, so all these little elements, but in a way and in a format that truly works for our young people as well. And so, yeah, I am fully fully signed up a uh, member of the fan club of all three of these people. I'll make a quick mention to the only person else who I think would qualify to be on such a call. And his name is Paul Emme. He um, created a black history timeline, which um, I still have. And I recommend anybody who has an opportunity to get a grip on it, to get a grip on it, because it just blows away this myth. And I, I remember Paul, when he was presenting the history timeline, when he made the point about slavery and you know the timeline literally spans the length of any good wall in any good size house and what paul pointed out to us that 
black history is this, slavery is this. And it is clearly illustrated on, on his timeline. So without further ado, um, as I normally do, I introduce my guest in the order in which they came onto the call. Um, yeah, I've done a bit of an intro this week, but I like for the guests to talk a little bit about themselves, um, just very briefly. So anything that I missed out is there. And this week, um, the rose again among thorns came first. So please, please introduce yourself. Can dance, that's you. Oh, was I first? Yes. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. So my name is Kandasi, as you said. I'm a Black history enthusiast. I don't consider myself a historian. I'd say I'm an enthusiast. I've been studying uh, Black history for about 10 years. I was interested in it from school. I went to secondary school in Barbados, but I've been studying it for over 10 years now outside of my day job. So I don't work in this field all the time but I do uh, writing, publishing, I do talks and various tours as well. And pretty much what you said, my mission and my passion is to pass this knowledge on to the younger generation, to teach them about the scope and the wonderful stories that are in black history and African history without focusing too much on enslavement. Because as you said, it's something that I think a lot of people learn about anyway. And it's also only a small part of the history. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my next guest is Mr. Tony Warner. Tony. Um, yeah, we run um, Black History Walking Tours in 12 different parts of London, North, East, South and West. We run um, Black History River Cruises up in the River Thames from uh, Embankment to Greenwich and back. We also have a Black History Bus Tour. Apart from doing the walks um, and the bus tours and river tours, et cetera, we do presentations and talks all year long on different aspects of African history from Black race civil rights to ancient African history. We do it on a regular basis. And then we have online courses, well, online courses now because of the virus, or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, so it's walks, talks and films. So every single month the last 13 years, we've shown an African Caribbean diaspora film at the BFI South Bank. We get up to like 400 people coming to watch a picture. It's the only place in the whole country that actually has a regular spot for African films. So it's what talks films each month all along, and that's what we do. Guys, you know, he says it as if 13 years of doing something every single month is something that you can just gloss over. Um, it's, it's an uh, outstanding achievement. Yeah, let, let's not fudge this in any way or can. The ability to get that sort of material together with such consistency or such a long period of time and at such a high level of quality is something that we need to applaud and we need more to see more of it. And um, I think probably the only other human being who could match that sort of dedication is my third and final guest, Mr. Robin Walker. Hi, Robin. How are you doing, sir? I'm very well. Robin, introduce yourself quickly. Okay, my name is Robin Walker. I'm also known as the Black History Man. And what I do for a living is I teach Black History and Black Studies up and down the country. Uh, me and my colleagues publish books. We run adult education courses. And my day job, if I do have a day job, is I work for an education charity called Croydon Supplementary Education Project. We are, among other things, a Saturday school and an education learning centre. Yep. Okay, guys. Thank you again, Robin. That's, 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 for me, those, those things are just a touch of what you guys do, because I think across the board, the word that I'm going to be using throughout the whole of this, and, you know, every week it happens to me, is inspirational and motivational. Yep. It's not just the raw knowledge, but it's the opening of eyes, you know, it's the opening of minds. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think one of the key things that I want to get out of today is not just the value of understanding a more in-depth and comprehensive view of African history to us as a people, but also to the 87, 83% who are white. For me, it is absolutely important for them to know. And, I, and I'm sure we'll touch, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, okay, so what, what I thought about when we were gonna discuss this topic and, and you know, you guys, your mics are all off do pitch in whenever you feel like, if you have a point to raise. And I, I'm just gonna kick off with a few questions, which, you know, I know where I work, one of the offices where I work in, 
this whole Black Lives Matter thing has kicked off a lot of dialogue. And probably every single time, whether it's online, whether it's face to face, one of the questions which comes up, I'm gonna start with you, Robin, if you can if you can help me with this one is, this question always comes up, which is, come on guys, it, it was 400 years ago. You know, how, how can you be trying to connect what happened 400 years ago with what's happening now? Robin, what do you say to that? The world of today was built 400 years ago. Or to be exact, the world of today was built in 1492. Uh, 1492 is what established the power relationships that we have now. So the post-1492 period, there was one winner, Europe, and there were two losers, us and the Native Americans. And the global geopolitics of the world today, who's rich, who's poor, who controls the world's resources, who controls the world's assets, and who doesn't. That was all established in 1492. So the world of today wasn't built today. It wasn't built yesterday. It was built 500 years ago. And that's why the past is still important. Can I just say something, right? Like when people say that to you, Paul, yeah, just, just ask them, have they ever heard of the Battle of Agincourt or 1066 or the Battle of Hastings, yeah? Ask them if they ever heard about um, World War II or ask them, when did England win, win World Cup? What year was that? And is that not revisited every single time we have a kind of football match, right? So if history is not relevant, why do they spend so much time and energy revisiting all those dates I just mentioned? Ask them that and see what they say. Well, you know, you know what they're gonna say. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're gonna they're gonna go, and they're, uh, but you know what they like to counter with is, okay, okay, okay. I hear you. It was bad then, but but we've come such a long way. Can dance, haven't we? Haven't we come such a long way? Uh, in my opinion, we haven't come that far. I mean, as Robin said, this stuff started in 1492. It was part of a project. It was about gaining power and about who would rule the world. And it was actually Europeans competing against each other. You know, France and Britain had a lot of wars and most of those wars actually took place in the Caribbean. So this was a fight about who is going to rule the world. And when you decide to do that, you have to put certain structures in place or certain things come about as a result. And those are still in place today, which many people can see. You can see that people are seeing this because we can see the protests that have been going on. And you realize from some of the signs that people are making the connections with what is going on today. So as a result of this colonial project, which enslavement of Africans was a part of, you have things like the rise of white supremacy, the idea of race with whites on top, blacks at the bottom. You have nations being impoverished. You have the result that you can see in Africa today and also the descendants of Africans. So the things that are happening today are directly related to events that have gone on before, the institutions that are in place today. I publish books for children and when I started doing this in 2008, I didn't even approach a mainstream publisher because I could already see the structures that were in place, how the institutions work. And I realized there was nobody who could publish the books the way I wanted to do them. And that's why I published them myself. So it's still very relevant today. It's how we have the racism, the colorism, the structures that are in place, the poverty, the trade agreements, the reparations that people are paying and so on and so forth. And can I give an example to do with pub publishing is that um, apart from me, actually Robin and Candice have all self-published because there's so much racism in the publishing industry. And to give an example, we just had Hashjet, which is a huge multinational publishing com company. They've come up with a statement supporting Black Lives Matter. And then it turns out that Professor Hakim Hadi had written a book um, designed for school children about four years ago. And then Hachet refused to publish that book, right? And they also refused to give him the copyright to make him, like, that him actually publish the book himself. So in, in one respect, they're saying we, we support Black Lives Matter, we support Black History, etc. But when it comes to books, which they have right now, they've refused to publish and reissue them and refused to invest in Black authors. So what does that tell you about how far we come forward? Robin, your, your, your book, When We Ruled, I just took a quick look. It's right there on my bookshelf. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'll hold my hand up. Not finished it yet. Working my way through it. Why did you self-publish? Because I knew there was no way that information was going to get out there any other way. Um, essentially, I took the project to uh, a gentleman, Patrick Vernon, who runs something called Every Generation Media. 
And he had this idea that black history could be mainstreamed. And so uh, I took the project to him. He liked the project and he liked the idea that we could try and mainstream ancient and medieval uh, African history. And he was the man to do it. Um, also, we spent a lot of money making sure that the book was really well printed, really well designed. We spent a ton of money on getting very, very high quality photographs, photographs that you don't usually see in black history books. Um, and that way we could put out a project without any editing or censoring coming from outside our community. My, my question as well, stick, it, stick with Robert for a sec, Robin for a second. Why was it so important to you in your book and, and, and your other books that you've done, why was it so important to you not just to continue this focus on slavery? What was the important driver for that? When I found out that black people really do have a history before slavery and the monuments are still standing, that blew my mind when I found that out. The manuscript still exists, that blew my mind. The fine art still exists, the jewelry still exists. So the impression most people have is before slavery, there's nothing. Uh, Professor Chancellor Williams wrote The Destruction of Black Civilization. He gave the impression that what slavery did was destroy everything. Slavery destroyed a lot, but a lot survived. And the stuff that survived needed to be seen. So I wanted to show people the ruins of cathedrals built by their ancestors, the ruins of mosques built by their ancestors, the ruins of palaces. I mean, for example, did you know that there was a palace built somewhere around the year 1200 in Tanzania with an octagonal swimming pool uh, in the palace? And the ruins of that swimming pool are right now. In fact, people can even go on Google Earth and Google it and they can see it for themselves. There's also a lot of stuff in museums as well. There's a lot of stuff in the European museums. I've been doing some traveling around and looking in museums and there's so much of the history in there as well. We actually have an event on that later on. We have an event titled um, Looted African Artifacts in European Museums. We can go around all of Europe to like Czechoslovakia and Poland and Germany and Belgium and expose or yeah, expose all these African artifacts in there and explain how it got to be there and how you have these, these mainstream institutions making lots of money from stuff that didn't belong to them. Tony, I, I want to ask you a question on top of what, what Robin was saying about this exposure of stuff, because for me, that's very critical. And it's also an integral part of what you do with your Black History Walks. Yeah. Yeah, so when, when you're going around London, yeah, because I know you do these walks around London, you do them down the Thames, you do stuff like that. What's the sort of thing that people who come on your tours see and go, oh my God, I never knew? Um, well, the reaction is always often one of shock, surprise, sometimes anger. The things that freak them out is the amount of African gold in the, uh, the um, Bank of England. They can't, they, they're amazed at the, the, how much of, it, of gold, gold is in there from Africa. They're amazed that it's actually named the Guinea. So the, a lot of the gold that was... Um, Brought from Africa came from the Guinea coast of Africa. So they actually, the British actually named a coin, the Guinea coin, because the gold to make that coin came from the Guinea coast of Africa. And that Guinea coin is still in the Bank of England right now as a, as a, uh, a term of uh, a currency. And there's also literally lots of solid gold in there, right? So when people realize that and realize that they actually were actually taught about um, guineas and economy and, and commerce in schools, they, they feel a bit kind of robbed, left out, you know, kind of... Um, um, taken advantage of. So that's a real shock for them. The other thing that freaks them out is how far back there's been an African presence here going back to Roman times, at least that we can prove very easily. And that's always a big shock for people. And then the level of money that's coming out of the Caribbean to support and maintain and, and build the whole country. So for example, West India Docks, which is now Canary Wharf, that was built 200 years ago, it was built by a consortium of, of, of sugar merchants and slave traders who made their money from um, slavery and sugar in the first place, and then used that money to invest and build that massive, enormous dock complex, which is still there now, and is underlying foundation for Canary Wharf. So all that kind of stuff is what freaks them out and just makes them kind of get crazy. Well, not, not crazy, but motivates them, gets them vexed, makes them sad, makes them angry, and really makes them kind of appreciate how much African people have done for this country. How, 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 how in terms of the mix, of people who come on your your walks 
and attend your lectures, Robin. What's the mix like? Is it representative of our community, which is, you know, 3% black, 83% um, white and the rest are in between? Is, is that representative on your walks or, t or Robin, on your talks? Do you want to go first? I'll come to you. All right, I'll so first. you go first. All right. Um, Generally speaking, uh, my classes are all nearly 100% black. Um, very occasionally, you might see somebody of European ancestry, uh, but usually that's because they're married to somebody black or they've got half black children, something like that. Uh, sometimes if I see someone that looks kind of Mediterranean, you can usually work out they're Turkish. And what that is, is, you know, Turkish people, if you know anything about Turkish families, a lot of them have got black members of the family. So they may look, to all intents and purposes, white or Mediterranean, but they're actually part black in many cases. And they want to know about that stuff too. So I'll get them on my courses. I have had a couple Sikhs on my courses, so big up to some of the Sikh posse that's been on my stuff. But generally speaking, it's almost all African stroke Caribbean. And then what about your books? Do, do white parents um, buy your books for their children to educate them? So um, I would, uh, uh, sorry, I would say, uh, so I actually do some tours as well of the Petri Museum. I've been doing those for about 10 years. And I would say that the vast, vast majority of people on the tour are definitely black as well. Echoing what Robin said, before the pandemic and everything shut down, I would say I was getting more white people coming on the tours though. Still majority black, but I was getting more white people coming as well. So I have seen an increase uh, recently, but it is still overwhelmingly black. That's on the tours. In terms of the books, I would say my first three books, I believe most of the readers are black. I don't always know because they're sold on Amazon and other places, and I don't always see who buys them. But in terms of the latest one, the story of the Windrush, I think this is the one that you were talking about, this one here. Mm -hmm, yeah. I would say this one is picked up by, hard to say, but I think this is being picked up more generally than the other three. So Fine. that's my experience. So a bit of differences depending on the topic and what I'm doing exactly. I can talk about several different audiences because like for the war, so I'd say roughly it's like 75, 75%, 8% black, but then we get people from overseas who come as um, students. So we get like all white groups, 15, 20 students from, you know, different universities in America who are over here on what they call the study abroad course. So that's a whole different chunk of people who come. And then we get old retired people, mostly African-Americans who got, you know, time to spare and they're traveling and they come as well. But when it comes to films now, sometimes we can put on a certain film where we can get like a 50% or 80% white audience, yeah? Depends what the film is, who the star is, what the topic is. But I've had events at the BFI South Bank, which are titled African Odysseys, and we've had like majority white audiences in there watch the pictures, and it's been packed out sometimes. And, and you know, the reason why I'm asking this question, because one of the things I, I jotted down before we started, and again, this is open to anybody, is... We, we, we talk a lot and, you know, there's always been this, this, this conversation about, you know, black people need to know their history. It's important that we know our history and no doubt it's important. But especially over the last three weeks, with some of the conversations that I've been having online, in the workplace, it's dawned on me for some time, but I think the last three weeks have put the emphasis. And I want to know you guys' thoughts on what's the importance of white people having access to this world history. You know, I, I stopped calling it black history because it's actually world history. Robbie, wh why should they also know and they should also have an interest? What, what do they gain? Um, I can work out what they should gain, but I don't know what they actually gain, do you see? Um, and because I don't really have people like you know the Europeans queuing up to do my material I'm probably not the best person to ask <laughs> okay let, let, me, let me let me try and put it another way what do you think they could gain if they if they watched it if they knew yeah, I, I, the main thing is is that they would gain a new respect for us because they would see that by the standards of civilization that they they teach 
the importance of writing, the importance of high art, the importance of high um, uh, architecture, the importance of high forms of music and uh, development of law and that kind of thing. We've contributed to that stuff too. And in fact, if you were to write the chapter on anything, say architecture, the first few chapters of that is going to be in Africa. If you want to talk about literature, the first few chapters of that is also going to be in Africa. If you want to talk about mathematics, the first few chapters of that is going to be in Africa. Um, and I think one of the reasons why you, I don't get huge amounts of Europeans coming on this is they don't like to be decentered. They like to be the center of the discussion. Even if the discussion is negative, they like to be the center of it. And that's why they'd rather talk about even Hitler than they would before they talk about Mansa Musa. Yeah, I forgot to mention that we, we, we also put on talks, right? So we used to put on talks in um, the Imperial War Museum, Museum of Docklands, National Portrait Gallery, et cetera. And for some of those talks, you could have up to 20%, 25%, Sometimes 50% of the honest being white. And what they would, well, what they told me they got from being in those spaces and hearing that history is that they were astonished, moved, embarrassed, a little bit ashamed sometimes. Um, but they really felt um, robbed, is what they'd often say. They felt they, they, they said to me, How come I didn't, wasn't taught this in school? Um, I feel so ignorant. Um, I wish I'd known this earlier. That's what they will tell me when they've come up to the talks and also for the, uh, the walks as well. That's what comes up over and over again the fact that they feel, felt that they've been. Um, robbed of their history and they've, they've been kind of left out and they feel marginalized because they've not been told the truth about their backgrounds. Tell us this, again the same question to you. Yeah well I do think that there are a lot of people, white people, who are aware of the effects of empire and want to know more about it and are interested and I think that what could be gained potentially is people having a better understanding of each other but obviously that does take some modesty, it does take honesty and bravery, and that's sometimes very difficult. I notice that the way a lot of programs are positioned or books, they will say things like mankind began in Africa, and it will say that, but then that's it. There's nothing else until the history starts outside of Africa. So I always wondered whether people were really interested or not. But like I said, because I have had a few more people starting to come, people of European descent coming to the Petrie tours before, they have seemed to be open to it. What exactly will be gained or where it will go, I don't know, but I have sensed recently a little bit more openness, although, and, and people interested in hearing it from an African perspective. So, but hard to say exactly what would be gained because it's something I've only noticed recently. You see, I, I, I um, during just this week, um, you know, in this revolution where everybody thinks Black Lives Matter, um, every workplace is now, oh my God, we never knew. So one of my, my colleagues at my office, um, we, it, the, the, the office put up a thing saying that such and such a day will be Windrush Day. Um, and um, they inboxed me and said, what's Windrush Day? Mm. Yeah, yeah, you, you can pop your eyes out. But <laughs> that's what that's what they inbox me and ask me. So Paul being Paul, I wrote chapter and verse about the entire Windrush from Tilbury Docks all the way up to present time, including sitting in limbo on BBC. I wrote the whole thing and I didn't just send it back to the person. I posted it on the corporate website. Yeah, because, hey, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> There's not a lot they can do. So I posted it there and we ended up having a three day, well, they, not me, a three day conversation about race on, on the corporate website. So it's like a chat, very similar to Facebook. Yeah. And there was this three day conversation. And, and the reason why I was asking the question about what they stand to learn is because and I'll use the word correctly, the absolute level of total ignorance that I witnessed in terms of, oh my God, does that really happen? Now, of course, I know some of them know, and I know some of them are putting it on, but I've got to tell you, I think a lot of them just don't know. And I, I rationalize 
that lack of knowledge by saying, well, why would they know? You know, they, it's not in their interest. It's not something they need to know. I grew up in the Caribbean and I didn't know. You know, when I turned up here 31 years ago, I, I'll hold my hand up. I thought black people here were a bit slow because I thought, how can you have all of this and not be running the thing? And then over the years, that lesson as to why we are where we are got knocked into my head and that arrogance departed. So I can imagine for someone who's brought up, I don't know, Shropshire, Gloucester, some place where the only black person they know and ever heard of is Frank Bruno, or now, you know, I don't know, Jay-Z and Beyonce. But what do they know about, about why Windrush happened? What do they know? Do they understand why all the things that we are complaining about and we are saying, look, this got to stop, you know? Do they even understand that just because they see a black man who may be wealthier than them, that doesn't mean we've arrived. So, so that, that's where I'm coming from. And, you know, I wonder what you guys think. Have I broken you all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, you go, man. No, I ain't got nothing to say on this one, bro. This, this one's your field. All right. Well, what can I say? Well, first of all, when it comes to Frank Bruno, I remember being mistaken for Frank Bruno by <laughs> what, Yeah, exactly. That's what's cracking up, right? That's what's cracking up, right? And the fact that people here don't know, white people here don't know this history is quite deliberate because um, if I go back to like the 70s, People like Len Garrison and the West Indian uh, Standing Conference were lobbying to get black history on the curriculum from back at least in the 60s, 70s. And they actually wrote down documents to, to actually use in schools. And Len Garrison actually, actually got some stuff in schools. But you don't really find black history being included in the curriculum until like the 80s. And then what they did is they kind of switched it. So they said, if we're going to do black history, we're going to talk about slavery. But we're going to talk about it from a kind of um, the white perspective as to, you know, we abolished it. So they don't talk about the resistance, the revolts, the over, the, the Re Haitian revolution or the people who fought back against um, uh, slavery. They tend to focus on abolition and how, how successful that was, thereby giving the narrative that, you know, well, there was slavery, but, you know, we ended it and everything's cool. So that helps to explain why people are so ignorant. But like I say, it's, it's a deliberate design by the powers that be to brainwash one set of people and disempower another set of people so they can maintain the status quo and just avoid responsibility for what has happened in the past, which still affects us in the future and in, in the present. I agree. And I think one thing you said, Paul, you said it's not in people's interest. I don't know. I think it is in people's interest, but I think that it does go, as Tony said, a lot of it goes to the education system. If you are not taught about these things in school, and if by design, as a result of the colonial project, as a result of things that happened, we said in the beginning, since 1492, if you're designed not to know those stories or to know that history, then how are you gonna know? The people that you do know, many of them just come across it by accident or because they just met someone who told them it's not in schools, your parents don't know, your grandparents don't know. So how can people be really expected to know, right? So that's part of the problem, that's part of the challenge. And also, don't forget, in fact, you know that you know this, Paul, because if you live in the Caribbean up until the 80s, when you set exams in St. Lucia, Jamaica, Barbados, etc., they'd be set and marked in England. Remember that? Okay. Yeah, that's what used to happen. So <laughs> it's not an accident at all that, that there's a, this lack of awareness, even in the Caribbean to this very day, as well as in the so-called mother country, because the mother country was determined to kind of erase and cover up their abusive, atrocious history. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a, a, an uncomfortable question. I, well, I find it uncomfortable sometimes, even though, again, through attending one of the sessions that I know Tony ran, I, I've been able to handle that a little bit more comfortably. So again, you know, you see it all the time. It's, it's almost a snap response, but black people sold black people. And cheese on bread. Look, look, <laughs> look let me, let's talk about World War II, yeah? And let's think about, in World War II, did any French people collaborate with the Germans? In World War II, did any Belgian people collaborate with the Germans? In World War II, did any English people 
collaborate or sympathize with Hitler because there's a guy called Oswald Mosley who was living here, an aristocratic fellow who was in fear of Hitler, right? And he survived the war and was out there in Notting Hills telling black soldiers who'd fought against Hitler that they should go back where they came from. That's Oswald Mosley, who was a pro-Hitler aristocrat, aristocrat pro posh person, right? But also think about this, that when the war was going on, there were white rich people who went to hang out in Barbados and the Caribbean to avoid the, effort, the effects of the war. And there's a guy called Lord Hawthorne. Lord Hawthorne was a, an English guy who was a proper sellout who would actually broadcast Nazi propaganda throughout the war. So when it comes to people selling people out, this, this is something that happens wherever you are in the world. People will sell out other people because, you know, isn't it because they're selfish, because they, you know, they have no kind of a pride, etc. But it's not something that is unique or to black people at all. So that in itself is just like a, a, a standard racist stereotype. It's like you lot saw each other as, as if to say that white people wasn't killing each other in World War II and World War I and actually sent each other out all throughout the entire period. Robin, Robin, one of the things that I, I've been been talking about recently is, you know, we, we have this, this question which always comes up when we so-called woke people are having these conversations and somebody will say, but we're not united. Yeah, they'll, they'll throw that into the mix and say, we're not united, we can't do this. And, and, and my response typically is two words, Berlin Conference. Because in my understanding of the Berlin Conference, they united, they wouldn't like each other to begin with, but they had a problem. And that problem was how to rape Africa. What's your response when people say, look, we're not united? From a historical point of view, what, what, what do you say? Um, throughout history, black people coming together to build empires, to unify material and mental means. That's what empire building is. Um, there have been loads of examples of that in African history. Um, there was a time when all two thirds of West Africa was under one government, the Songhai Empire. There was a time when Zimbabwe, South Africa, the Transvaal region, Mozambique, uh, a bit of Botswana, all the way up to Zambia was one political unit, the Mutapa Empire. Um, and when we look at some of the great uh, Pan-Africanists like the great Marcus Garvey, having a movement of 6 million people dotted over 40 different countries in an age before social media, in an age before Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. This is absolutely extraordinary examples. And when it comes to um, unifying with other black people, what people forget is, if you're bringing something to the table, people will want to unify with you. It's when you're not bringing something to the table and you're asking for unity. And what are the examples during slavery as well, like Republic of Palmares and things like that? Were those examples as well of black people coming together from different groups, different ethnic groups? Well said. And then you've got the, you know, um, if you if you read African American accounts of what they thought of the Haitian Revolution, yeah, right, they were really inspired by it. Um, I've since found out that the great classical composer in America, William Grant Still, even wrote an opera based on the Haitian Revolution. You know, um, so the main point is is uh, the examples of disunity. In my, ex my experience, usually comes from people who are themselves not about unity. But there are people that are about unity. Um, just, sorry, carry on, brother. No, no, just, just, just making one final point. Um, getting people to work with you on projects, if you're bringing something to the table, I haven't found any difficulty doing that. And I suspect other people here have found the same thing. Right. So let me jump in here. Yeah? 1958, Notting Hill. There's a bunch of white racist thugs driving into Notting Hill to beat up black people, right? A guy called Baron Beer, a Jamaican guy called Baron Beer, ex-military veteran, ex-RAF veteran, right? Sets up a, a black self-defense group to patrol Notting Hill and protect the people from harassment and abuse, yeah? In that group, you got Trini, St. Lucians, Dominicans, there's a whole bunch of black guys, Muslim ex-service personnel who are actually protecting the area. So when these so-called riots you hear about kick off, it's because the black people, um, headed in for one respect by Baron Baker, organized a resistance and a fight back against these white people. So a whole bunch of different black people got together to fight, beat up, kick out these racist thugs from Notting Hill. And during this so-called rioting period, which is basically black self-defense, 
convoys of black guys from Brixton was driving across the river each night to back at their bedroom, right? So <laughs> you could go back to any period of time, you can find that people from African Caribbean connection uh, backgrounds have united, got together to literally fight for them, their freedom and defend themselves, right? Whether it might be with physical fists or it might be just getting together to work on a book or a project or, or a teaching uh, workshop or session like we, we have all done within this, within this group here, or even this like this little kind of session here where, you know, you got a beard in there, you got a Jamaican there, and I forget where Robin's from, but it doesn't matter, right? Because he could be from Uganda for all we know, but here we are. Look, just so you know, doing my research, I found out that uh, Robin went to a school in a place called Gregory Park. So you do. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right, Robin? Yeah, true saying, true saying, true And true let me just... Saying. Yeah, and, and you don't get more Jamaican than Gregory Park. Right. And let me go back to this point about people selling each other out, yeah? I've got a couple of books here, we just want to show the people who are watching, right? This one's called Agent Jack. Agent Jack by, what's his name? Um, Robert Hudson. It's all about white English people who spied for the Nazis in England during World War II and tried to sell their secrets to the Germans, yeah? So they actually live in here, giving secrets away to the Germans. That's, that's the whole point of the book, right? Then you got this book here about a guy called Rumkowski. Rumkowski was a Jewish person, a Jewish person, rather, who sold the other Jewish people. There's another book called The Emperor of Lies by, what's it called now? Steve Sem Sandberg, all about people of Jewish descent who were collaborating with the Nazis during World War II. I think it's fair to say we have nailed that point to death. We have, you know, there's, there's, there's even more stuff. Dead. No, no, there's even more stuff, bro. Um, ask Western Europeans why they dislike Eastern Europeans. In fact, try that at work and, and get some honest answers on what the real beef is they've got with Eastern Europeans. And ask them why they call Eastern Europeans Slavs. Go and ask them. Yeah. You see, you don't want me to have a job for Christmas. Is that what you're talking about? That is not, that is not to mention. <laughs> That's not that's to mention something that's called the War of the Roses. There's something called the War of the Roses. We had a whole bunch of white people, you know, fight each other in England. So that's the nonsense, man. Okay, guys, look, I, I, I got, I got, you know, a bit of a, a mind-blowing experience. I think it was last year, um, just after they they had the, the Windrush thing really blew up. I don't know if it was a year before. This whole year is a bit of a myth to me. And there was a, a guy, his name is David Osilagas, I think his name is. He, he did a, a program where he, he was talking about what happened after slavery was transformed into its new form. Yeah, I, I try not to use the word abolished because it ain't true. And he, he was pointing out stuff that I didn't know. You know, uh, my name is Lawrence, which is a good Scottish name, as a Scottish guy at one of my offices told me. And he was explaining, for example, how the monies that came back as compensation for, for slaves in the Caribbean and the Americas, how that came back into the coffers here and how that money generated a lot of the, the revolution we saw in the UK, the, the road building, the insurance companies, the banks, the shipping companies were all funded on this because suddenly, and, and I think that the mind blowing part wasn't the fact that the money came back. I knew that. But the mind blowing part was the, the part that when he explained that actually it wasn't very usual for a plantation owner to actually own the slaves. Typically it was people back in Britain, back in Scotland, back in the UK who were the slave owners and they actually rented them. So there's like, they probably owned two or 10, but owning 200, 300, it happened but it wasn't the run of the mill thing. And I didn't know stuff like that. And, I, and I'm wondering in, in your reading, in your research, what's the kind of things you have come across? Well, I know for you guys now, it's probably second hat now, you probably have always known it. But what's the sort of thing that you've come across, which if you can remember that far back, it blew your mind, or when you're delivering your talks, when you're delivering your walks, you can see people getting that mind blowing moment. What, what's the sort of thing that, two or three things that just, just stands out when you deliver your talk. Robin? Okay, um, let, me, um, let me come back in about 30 seconds. I'm gonna go and get a box, I'm gonna show you an image. Go for it. Somebody else wanna okay. jump in in the meantime, yeah? Somebody else um, wanna jump in. 
So you're talking about in respect of slavery, particularly anything, or just generally anything, anything. with black history, which in your experience, when you when you when you say it, you look at people's eyes and you see the pupils dilate and you know this is a mind blown moment. When I tell people that they were black Spitfire pallets, <laughs> and like I've got the pictures too, you know. I got the pictures of I got pictures of black bummer pilots who were in prison war camps for two years. who came back out was actually then then became the attorney general for Sierra Leone. Then became like um, they're actually on the Windrush. There's if you give people uh, just a few facts like from World War. Just if I just stick to World War Two, yeah. If I show people how the Caribbean was crucial to Britain winning World War Two because the oil that we were supplying our troops and tankers with in the in 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 occupied France, etc. To, to help D-Day, that all came from Trinidad and, and, and the, uh, the Dutch islands there, Curacao and Aruba. It was shipped across here in tankers. It was a whole secret thing that they bring the oil from the Caribbean to um, Europe to help fight a war effort. And that's where we got oil from. That's a, that's a fact. I've got a whole bunch of books on that too. So when you tell people that and you show them the book as well, they're like, oh, I can't believe it. Because, I mean, it is true. It's just that, I suppose, because I've been so miseducated for such a long time they hear the fact that they couldn't win world war ii without this caribbean resource and the camera is also a fear of, of, of conflict and violence in world war ii that is just one example of how the heads are blown just from that alone i i, I didn't know that I, I knew about the people but i didn't know about stuff like the oil i, I didn't robin's back robin what, what you got for us you see that yes yeah, you've got to talk so that we'll see you right you, you can see that yeah 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 we can see them Okay, uh, someone gave me this book here. It's called The Living Arts of Nigeria. And those leather boots were from Kanu, which is northern Nigeria. And that's traditional Kanu manufacture. Can you uh, hold it up again, Robin? Hold up again, please. Yeah. Wow. Cool. And yeah, they're in the British Museum. And then you go to the uh, Liverpool Museum and they've got a different set of Kanu boots and shoes. In other words, in medieval times, Kanu in northern Nigeria was the centre of the African leatherworking industries. And the boots, the shoes, the clothes, the textiles used to dress half of early West Africa, do you see? So that is how we were going on back in the days, yeah? For me, uh, I would say the main one is when I am taking people around the Petrie Museum and I show them the face of the, of the first pharaoh and I say to them, okay, so everyone's heard of Tutankhamun, you've heard of all these other people. Have you heard about the guy who actually created ancient Egypt, united the upper and lower Egypt? And then they're like, no. And then you say, not only do we know who he was, we've even got his image. And then I show them this image, which is in the Peachy Museum. I loved it so much, I had to put it in my book. And then I show them Pharaoh Nama. And most people are really, really shocked by that. Sometimes you get some people coming, mainly African-Americans, who have seen that image a lot. And they are blown away by the fact that it's actually there in the museum. But most people don't know about it at all. So I'd say that's, the, that's probably the number one thing. But there are other things as well, like with Nefertiti when you show them all the images of Nefertiti and you tell them, well, actually they're like almost a hundred images of her and they've only ever seen that one in Berlin, which looks different from all the rest. You can see people are quite shocked by that as well. The Afrocomb, people are shocked when you tell them that they were Afrocombs in ancient Egypt. So there's lots of stuff. You can just, it's just that question. It's, it's you just have to think, there's, you could probably come up with hundreds of things. There's, because people don't know this history, right? So when you tell them anything, it's a shock. I think I think what 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 gets me and you know it, it makes me laugh and 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 you know want to cry in, in the same amounts is that all the examples you've given are things that are known but they're kept from the masses. They are kept from the masses and that's why you know my recent writings what I have said is you know what we, we can talk all we want to talk yeah they do not have a desire to change because they know these things. They know these bits and pieces. And, that it, they, and when I say they, I'm talking about, especially the private educated guys, the guys who are privately educated get a completely different education. 
Yeah, it's not a hundred percent on ball, but they have knowledge of these things. And I was remembering just another example of how not telling history affects the current day. Again, there was an analysis of the causes around the Windrush scandal. And, and, and part of that analysis found that the current or the, the Home Office staff of the time, and when I say of the time, I mean those who enabled the policies to be written in the way they were written, when they were interviewed, they realized that this group of people, their 30 somethings, were unable to understand the connection between the Canolian Caribbean and India and so on, and the UK. So in their minds, they couldn't make the link to understand how a child could have come up on a British passport, i.e. their mother and their father's British passport, not had a passport of their own, but by virtue of the consequence of, you know, whatever year your island got its bit of independence, you were a British a citizen. They couldn't get that. And that's the staff who were responsible for assisting in the writing. So when members of the Labour Party made their thing and said, look, guys, this is going to disproportionately affect people, you know, because we all know it wasn't just about us, but the way it was worded and the way it worked, there were people who saw that it would disproportionately affect what we call undocumented uh, people who were, aside from the lack of documents, were totally legal. So there's an agenda, as we always say, there's an agenda to keep history, not just from uh, us as, as people of African descent, but also from the people who may be able to change how policies are written. You know, we need advocates if we're going to win this. And if the advocates are miseducated as well, you know, it's, it's an uphill struggle. And I, and I guess that's where I am now mentally. I'm trying to understand how do we get this information across. Before I forget, because we're almost, almost out of time this week, you three guys have to put your details in the chat on Facebook. Robin, there are people in there talking about your courses like they're better than sliced bread. I don't understand what's going on. Tony, it's the same thing with your walks. Apparently, everybody who's ever been on your walk is in my tread today. I, I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, But there are people out there who haven't been on your walks, haven't read one of your books, Candies, haven't done one of your lectures, Robin, mm -hmm. and they need to get this information. So before I forget, because it's that time of day, please remember that. So what I'd like from you three, in terms of your wrap-up statements, or, you know, just, just your wrap-up statements in terms of your area of expertise and what you would like people to be thinking about doing differently, whatever you choose, go. Um, I would say everyone should be really investing right now in online education because of the virus, obviously. Um, so that when things get back to normal, um, you can kind of come out and come on the walk or a talk or a film or a bus or a cruise. Um, so she really, really be taking this opportunity to actually learn as much online. So Robin's got stuff online. I'm doing stuff online. It's on our websites. My website is blackhistorywalks.co.uk, blackhistorywalks.co.uk. And make sure you join the mailing list because that's what we tell people what's coming up. We do, we, we'll never get sponsored by the Evening Standard, for example. So if you want to get this information to your inbox, make sure you join our mailing list. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. And also, speaking of publishing, there's a black female publishing house called Jack Around the Books. They're called Jack Around the Books. And I've just finished a 90,000 uh, 90, word book for them on London's Black History, and it comes out in October. So make sure you follow Jack Aranda. Make sure you kind of sign to the mailing list. And make sure you come to our stuff. Because one of the things that we do, right, is we spend a lot of time investing and putting on events physically. And sometimes for a really good, high-profile, good quality events, and people do not come. So if you're one of the people, then either, you know, sort yourself out or just get your behind to the event. Because oh, oh, you're, allowed, you're allowed to cuss. It's my show. You're allowed to cuss, Tori. Don't worry. When, when people put on these events, whether it's me or other organizations, because there's people who do events all, all year long, not just us guys, right? It's important that they are supportive, otherwise they get vexed, cheesed off, and they burn out, and they just say, I'm done with that foolishness. So if you see people putting on events, make sure you come down there and also make sure you give them some damn money too, to be honest, because people need investment. That's what needs to happen. People need to invest in all these um, events and, and the stretches we have now, because that's how we'll grow and get better, get, get bigger and better. Good. Who wants to go next? 
Well, I would echo what Tony said. It's important to get out there and actually support the event. You know, maybe you've got to turn off the TV, not watch your favorite soap opera for a couple of times and come out because it's the only way this stuff isn't going to be in the mainstream. For me, speaking of my particular interest with children, I would say don't wait for the schools to do it. Start doing it yourself. I've done four books. They're readily available. You can get them from New Beacon Books, a great black bookshop. They need the support. You can get them from Book Love. They've been doing a lot of multicultural stuff. You can get them, if you want, on Amazon as well. I've got a website, which is goldendestiny.co.uk. You can see what I do there. You can also contact me via Facebook or Twitter. My Twitter handle is KN Chimbiri. So that's easy to remember. And when I do my Petrie Museum tours again, come out, particularly if you're interested in ancient, ancient history, the Nile and Sudan, come out and I'll tell you about it and show you what you're missing. Robin? Yeah. Um... I am about to run a, a, an adult education course online through Zoom, through um, a company called Avril's Walks and Talks. The course is, uh, is gonna be called um, uh, Black British History uh, from 1948 till now. So we're gonna be dealing with the 70 years of Windrush history. And the idea really is to show that one of the reasons why um, the conservative politician Kemi Bazanok can say, Black Britain, uh, Britain's a better place for Black people to live than, say, France, than, say, Germany, and so on, is because Black Britons have engaged in political and cultural struggle. And what the course does is to highlight that political and cultural struggle. So Britain isn't a nice place for Black people just because British people are nice people. It's we struggle to get it to look like that. And that struggle we're going to be highlighting. So the, the website is Avril's Walks and Talks and look out for a course that I'm going to be doing. Guys, um, thank you. Um, my excitement has been worth it. And if I look at the trend on Facebook, then I think uh, there's mutual agreement. Look, the, the, the bottom line is we need to just remember the very basics, which we talk about. You know, we talk a lot and we say things a lot but we don't normally act on them and we need to start acting them. Access to our, to our history, knowing our history, knowing where we're from, knowing who we are, even in those broad terms is so, so important. It is important that we educate our young people in their history. Yep, you know, without, without your history, you're empty. You, you, you have nothing. Yep, your history is what nails down who you are. We can spend all day calling each other kings and queens. But if we can't put some, some meat on that, then it, it, it doesn't matter. And when we are opposed, when we are asked these, these questions about, you know, who sold out who, we need to be able to answer, not because it's going to change their minds, but because we need to demonstrate over and over that you're no longer right in our history. Yep. We have three examples of people here who write history, who write history which reflects us. And you know, the, the old cliche about history being his story and history being written by the victors. Well, let's, let's realize that our voices will not be silenced. We have people in our communities who are literally, and I don't care what Candace wants to call herself, historians, people who have the capacity to tell our stories in a manner which makes us not just look like victims, yeah. One of the things that I like to stress about it is about let's let's look at beyond it, beyond just that period of time that was known as slavery. And also to expand your reading. You know, we've got three people here who give you the opportunity to to look at their work. But there's a great body of work all over the place. Take your time, invest your time. As, as kind of said, you know, you might want to miss a soap opera or two. Go watch something else. Listen to something else. Um, as always, it's been a great pleasure. Um, I, I think it would be wrong of me not to mention something else. Um, Tony, I've known Tony from The Hunter Black Men, which, like I said, is probably approaching 20 years. Um, we, we work together in The Hundred. Um, you know, I, I'm a great supporter of the stuff he does. 
But more important than that, just about probably a year ago, Tony called me and said, Paul, I hear that you've been doing talks about people returning to the Caribbean. And, you know, wouldn't you like to do that on a much bigger platform? At the time, I was just doing it with the Jamaican High Commissioner going around to little local community centers and, and doing the talk. And Tony said, look, let's, let's do this on a bigger platform. And I didn't quite grasp how much bigger he meant because I think we had over 200 people at the first one, which puts, puts death to the lie that no one's interested in going back to, 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 to the Caribbean to live. You know, people are turning out wanting the information. And, you know, they say copying is the biggest sign of flattery. There's now a how to go back to Africa and live good spin-off, which is going and going great guns. Um, and if I listen to what Tony, Robin and Kenneth all have said, it's about supporting each other. There's sometimes people talk about them and they think it's about competition. This is not about competition. This is about having access to so much information. And that's why these people are special to us. That's why we must support them. That's why we must look out for the events. Guys, I'm going to remind you one more time. I don't think you, you, you get away with it. You have to put your details um, on the topic because people will be looking out for them. Ladies and gents, I hope you have a great rest of your Father's Day. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys today. And I look forward to next week's show. I, I have no idea yet what next week's show is going to be about, but I'm sure you guys will join me. Thank you. Thanks.